Welcome to the Ocular Surface Academy podcast, TFOS Dues 2 edition. Join us as we meet with the researchers behind this landmark international consensus. Each episode will feature practical clinical takeaways. Before we get to today's episode, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Hello, my name is Jack DeSange, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Medical Therapeutics here at Allegan, an AbbVie company. You've likely heard that AbbVie and Allegan have joined forces. We're very proud of the Allegan name and heritage, and we're now known as Allegan, an AbbVie company. We share a common goal of developing world-class products and solutions for patients, and it's been a seamless transition. AbbVie and Allegan share a common vision to act with integrity, to serve the community, to drive innovation, but also to embrace diversity and inclusion. Together, we're working to have a significant positive impact on eye care professionals and their patients. R&D will always remain one of our top priorities. Innovation is in our DNA. We're constantly looking for ways to transform ideas into new possibilities. We look for better pathways for disease treatment. Whether it's finding a new solution, a new formulation, or a new delivery method in glaucoma, or retinal diseases, or corneal and ocular surface disease, or refractive conditions. We continuously strive to reinvest in our future and offer an ever-growing portfolio of effective and affordable treatment options for a better tomorrow. I can't emphasize also enough the importance of our relationship with you and our collaboration with eye care professionals. We embrace our partnership with you and our shared goal of improving the quality of life of your patients. If you have any feedback, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and share it with us. But thank you for all that you do for the eye care profession and take care. Welcome your host and co-host for today's episode of the Ocular Service Academy podcast, Dr. Scott Schachter and Dr. Christopher Starr. Welcome. Now we continue our conversation with the entertaining and insightful Dr. David Sullivan. When you moved on from the original dry workshop and the next one was the MGD report, was that correct? Yes, that's correct. What, what, was, the stim what was the motivation to, to jump into MGD? So in that particular case, we were doing, I was actually doing a lot of work in my bone gland dysfunction, but here, again, it was a, a discussion that I had with Marat Doru, who had been originally tasked by Kazuo back in the original one to help with the TFOS dues. In a meeting in Istanbul, mentioned that um, Kazuo was very interested in my bone gland dysfunction. Could TFOS do something about this? I thought, sure, we can bring that up again. And so we brought it up with the board and we decided to see if we could create a workshop on this. Later, just as a, as a follow-up to that, the for, the for the contact lens discomfort workshop, we realized that we were focusing perhaps too much on the tear film per se. We needed to broaden this because the TFOS is about the ocular surface and tear film. So we went to contact lens discomfort and asked that. And then later it was the feeling that, hey, it's 10 years, maybe we should do a redo of TFOS dues because there's been so much published and so much increased research because of that. So for the myobian gland dysfunction workshop report, again, Kazuo suggested, could we do something like this? And we then invited people who were very, very active researchers in this area, both basic research and clinical, to be on the steering committee, then filled up the subcommittees, and off we went. More drama. Uh, I'm curious, was there, I, I love the harmonization committees and, the, and the, the, the detail that goes into harmonizing all the subcommittees with the, each edition of the, the dues report, TPOS dues. Did you have a committee that actually harmonized between dues one and the MGD workshop? Did, did you have to find, make sure that everything was sort of copacetic between the two? So we didn't, we didn't do that in terms of the uh, people knew what the, the TFOS dues was, but for the, for the myobian gland dysfunction workshop report, we, we ended up with a, a small group of people. It was primarily, I think it was Tony Braun, Gary Fox, Kelly Nichols, and myself, who, who went through these in detail. And then it, ultimately it was Kelly and myself that went through, again, everything, ev all the reports, every... So if we then increase that for the the contact lens discomfort, and then particularly for the, the TFOS dues too. What happens there is that the harmonization committee, a group of people, we then assign everyone who will have read all the reports. Uh, every one of them will have written comments or constructive critiques. But then we go through in absolute greater detail to make sure, to try to make sure that every reference is correct, that every, everything that has peer, is evidence-based, 
is to make sure that nothing is sort of people haven't lifted something from their own writing, but just to go through it in real detail to make sure that it is peer-reviewed, evidence-based, and even then we can make mistakes. In the pathophysiology report, there were some references that were missed or I missed or whatever, and so they were corrected later, but um, this is what the group does, so that the subcommittee is asked and tasked to try to do the best they can with this, and but then the harmonization group goes into really great detail. What Does it have support? And if it does not have support, if it's speculation, then it is either taken out or it is set accordingly. And when you when you took on TFOS dues too, what what changed back from ten years ago, two thousand seven to two thousand seventeen? You obviously must have had a, a lot more in, industry interest in supporting the disease state awareness was growing, lifestyles were changing, the iPhone came about, and we were recognizing there were a lot of other causes of dry disease and it was affecting quality of life. Was it a lot easier to get support second go around? Well, the, the first go around, uh, well, the second, second go around, TFOS had become established. And so TFOS now with the reports was known, the TFOS dues too, then now it, it, Amy was dealing entirely now with the funding for this one and going out and fundraising. And these companies change all the time. Their marketing people change, their business development people change, the people you go seek. But she was, she found it much, much, I think, less difficult to raise funds for the TFOS dues too. And at the, and at the same time, we were raising funds um, for a conference that we had had in Montpellier, which was another challenge. But the, the cost of these workshops, we consider that we bring people together once uh, in subcommittees, wherever they are. So we fly them wherever the midpoint of where all their subcommittee people come from. And this TFOS Jews too, a lot of them were in Paris. Uh, again, people are coming from all over the world. So if you're coming from New York City or coming from Japan, there you go. Chris's subcommittee met in New York City, which is down the street for him, but it wasn't. It wasn't somewhere else. But most of them were in Paris or London. These, they add up in terms of cost. For a hotel, they add up in cost. And then uh, organizations, the people's doing this stuff. And all of it's transparent, all of it's online, actually. You can download any of these TFOS reports in terms of not just the reports, but the audits from TFOS, where does the money go? But to put together these workshops, oftentimes they cost between eight hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars for the size of TFOS dues too, close to a million. If you do it a little bit less, maybe it's five or six hundred thousand, but they're really expensive. The same thing occurs for conferences. But TFOS and with Amy doing it right now, has been very, very successful and with input from other people helping to be able to raise these funds because they're important to companies. Most recently, when we did an ambassador report, we couldn't do the one in, in Lake Como, for example, but we had a smaller meeting, a global meeting in Rome. Um, there were companies contacting Amy, can we contribute to this? Because we would like our name associated. They don't have editorial control but they have the name. Right now, with about the launch we just made, the announcement of the next TFOS workshop, the Lifestyle Epidemic dot dot Ocular Surface Degrees, there are already companies now contacting Amy to see, can we um, support this? And so in doing this, a really important, another important feature is not only the work product that comes out and the transparency, and again, no agendas here, it's just as best as we can evidence-based, there, it's in the next subcommittee in terms of, we've learned from the previous one, in terms of education. And this is one that Chris has agreed to, to chair. This is critically important. We need to reach out more in the world. We need to get more people involved, more people understanding, and to educate people because so many of them don't. And as I'm jumping all over the place here for you, but I should note that some years ago I was invited to give a presentation in a meeting in Manila. And at the meeting, there was an afternoon session that Alcon was paying for, for a lot of the Malaysian doctors. And I sat in on the meeting. And one of the people got up to give a report on my boiling gland workshop from TFOS. I remember asking the Malaysian doctors at the table, have you ever heard of this before? And they said, no, we have not. So how do we increase awareness? Because as we learn this information, we generate this information. And as we go forward, like lifestyle, what we do to ourselves or what others do to us for the eye, 
and how it impacts ocular surface disease, how do we share that information the best? So it's a lot of work that goes into it, but also it's the input from everybody involved, but then that educational component, making people aware of what we've found, particularly clinicians, how do you do it? And so that's, that's a big challenge for the next one. And so, you know, and, I, and you, you, you make me think of something I wanted to ask you about and, and your, your body of research is uh, uncountable number, but one of your more recent projects looked at the effect of some chemicals on meibomian glands that just came out of Scapins last July. Is that right? You just had a sure. recent public Which one? Oh, the tea tree oil? No, the other the one. one the, uh, terpenin for all. We have preservatives in the cosmetics. The, preserve, the one on preservatives, right. That's what yeah. I talked about in Washington, D.C. Can you share some insights into that? Because that was really interesting. Sure. The, 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 we had two of them on preservatives. The original one was the benzoconium chloride and the formaldehyde releasers. And the next one had to do with the parabens and chlorophenicin and phenoxyethanol. I'll give an example for the, the first one we had with the, the formaldehyde releasers. These are common preservatives. Benzoconium chloride used to be put in, it's still put in you know, drugs that are treating, using for treating glaucoma. It's an, anti, it's an anti-bug, it's a preservative. And the problem is that as we, we had in 2007, I remember Christoph Baudouin saying that the greatest treatment so far that we've discovered by 2007 is getting rid of benzoconium chloride for many of these over-the-counter drops or, or prescribed drops, but it still hasn't happened. Formaldehyde releases are put in part to get away from that. But these things are nasty. In one of the earlier experiments we did in the laboratory with an ophthalmologist named Zhaman Chen, she's an external disease expert. She's now a vice chair in a department in, in China. Came into me and said, David, you know, I've put in all the different concentrations of these of formaldehyde uh, or formalin or formaldehyde. But all the cells, all these human meibomian gland epithelial cells, that these are cells that we immortalized from the human. They, they, look, they act pretty normally. And they, they, anyway, she said, they all died. All the different concentrations with the formaldehyde died. I said, whoa, that's not good. That doesn't really help you in terms of continuing your study in formaldehyde. I said, but perhaps, Shaman, maybe it could be that when the formaldehyde of the higher concentrations that are used actually and approved clinically, maybe the gas could have escaped and, sh and moved out into all the other wells. Maybe if you split up the plates. So you have one concentration in one plate and other concentrations. That so she did that. Then she came back in, whoa, David, guess what? The, the ones with the lower concentrations survived, not too well, but they survived. The ones with the higher concentrations, of course, died. And the, the one concentration that was approved that for your eye, at least in Europe, all the cells look perfectly normal because they were all frozen in time. They had pretty much turned into plastic. You could play Frisbee with them. And this is what we're doing to our eye. So essentially what we found is that the levels that are approved for human use of benzoconium chloride is 20,000 fold higher than we need to kill completely the human meibomian gland epithelial cells. And those formaldehyde releasing products at levels 2,000 times higher than you need to kill all the human and myeloid and epithelial cells. That's what's being put in some of these products. These are cosmetics. And there's really no control in the United States. There are only, I think, 11 or 13 ingredients that are disallowed, whereas there are thousands in Europe. So it's becoming, we created this. We've been looking at a number of things, these, be it the tea tree oil, which is a fascinating one to itself in terms of what that does and what that, that impact is, and also the other effects that it has. But these preservatives and what is being allowed in cosmetics. So essentially what you're doing is people are putting these cosmetics on their eye or on their eyelid or on their ocular surface or wherever, and these, these are just causing havoc probably. And when you have people gradually, for example, who get older, and maybe more prone to something like dry eye disease, then you may just tip the, the balance. And so they develop it. But a lot of these cosmetics, we've only sort of touched a small portion of them. But the ones in the, in the, the publications that we've had recently, they're absolutely fascinating. I didn't know about this stuff. I didn't know these things. And one of the Jean Chen really wanted to do things on preservatives. Let's do these. And so let's, let's check into this. And then we followed up with it. And 
we realize that this, this stuff that we put on the eyelid or around the eye to make somebody look nice is really doing damage. And we just need to, again, increase awareness of what we're doing or look for alternatives. And I remember gave a presentation about some of these cosmetics and, and a colleague, Pedro Hammer in, in Boston said, David, do you realize that, that it's gonna take 10 years for these people to try to process this information that you just gave them? And we need to do a better job of that. You know, when you find something, and again, if you find some things that are done in vitro, you need to correlate it in vivo. But again, be aware. And so it's these lifestyle things that we do. And, it's, and for cosmetics, and he said, by the way, you know, people, and as other people have said, women, for example, although men use them too, aren't going to stop using cosmetics because it hurts. They, they need to use them for other reasons. And so how can you come up with things that are safer, whether it be cosmetics or whether it be drugs or be treatments? And this is just something, again, that we need to do. So with TFOS and the outreach and always trying to bring more and more people involved, as we learn more, how best do we share that information? And so it's at places like when you gave the congressional briefing, is really helpful because the staffers learn about it and Congress learns about it. And maybe people can start to consider what to do about it. But I think outreach to the clinicians and also the researchers to do more research is very important as well. Do you, do you think that, so do Europe, European standards, do you think that they are stringent as you'd like them to be? I'm sure the European standards could be increased dramatically. I think the number of things that we put in, when you look at the products that are, people are using cosmetics just around the eye, these are cancer inducers, they're mutagens, they're toxins. It's really amazing what they are. Some of them, like the turpentine for all, which is the key ingredient for tea tree oil, and you, you may not want to get into this right now, or maybe, but typically a dose for what a month is 5%, you know, the concentration, stick it on the eye and, and do it to get rid of those little bugs. This, this stuff at, at even the amount that can get into the eye is like 0.2 to 0.3% of that constant of, of the total. That's enough over 24 hours to completely wipe out human myeloma gland epithelial cells and culture. The other thing too about tea tree oil is it can promote antibiotic resistance. It has estrogen effects. You don't want estrogens all jumping all over your myeloma gland. It's going to help potentially produce uh, MGD. It's known to, if you have enough of it, induce gynecomastia in guys. It's really crazy. And the thing is that most people don't understand this and the studies haven't yet been done. Yet it's been adopted so greatly because it kills the bugs. But what you need to do is figure out, hey, what are we doing to people and what are we doing to their eyes? You know, right. I got uh, a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old daughter who I've just recently started getting into the whole you know, skin care routine that they do every day and are getting really into it. And, and you know, they see advertisements on social media and they, they're friends and they're sharing. And uh, a lot of it is obviously eye related. And I honestly, uh, I'm worried and I'm trying to educate them, um, speaking of education and getting them the, the proper products. Of course, eyes are the story we're involved with and I have them using that now. But, uh, but I, I do think it's extremely concerning for kids these days. And you know, in the age of the pandemic and everybody wearing masks and really their eyes really are the story in a lot of ways, because that's the one identifiable feature that people can see these days. And so I am petrified to some degree that my kids are creating some long-term damage to their eyes with these, you know, over-the-counter unregulated cosmetics. And they should never share them. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I know. I, I, you know, and I tell them all these things and, you know, do they listen to me? No. Well, you I'm know, fine. there's not, there's not an eye doctor in practice who hasn't seen behind a slit lamp my bombing glands coated with black eyeliner concealer, I think floating in the tear film all over the place. And as, as men clinicians, I know I find myself not really comfortable advising women how they should, I feel it's a very sensitive subject, but I'm actually starting to broach that subject now by taking photographs. And when they see those black flecks on top of their meibomian glands or that haze floating around in their eye. I'm finally starting to open that conversation. And, and Chris, maybe I can talk you into it. I've talked to Amy Sullivan a long time ago. I've, I've threatened to create a makeup for guys 
lecture primarily that there is probably a double entendre there, but it's mostly for makeup for it's like makeup 101, you know, what does, what is mascara? What is eyeliner? What is, I mean, there's a massive number of things that women do to themselves to look how they look. And, and we need to be tuned into that because it's absolutely sitting on the eye all day long, getting into my bone and glands and getting into the, I mean, have you ever, you flipped a, a lid and seen makeup on a conjunctiva, right? You've seen concretions forming over mascara or makeup. So, so I think that's something that, that it, it was a real, you know, we just have to take that on as clinicians and, and talk to people. And it is, it's, it's a tough subject. It, there, there's a look that some people just won't give up, but we can at least educate them about what this might be doing. To and them. I just note here too, though, it's, it's really hard to do it. Men wear cosmetics too, but um, perhaps women more so at least in numbers, but most, most men, for example, are not, are not conversant in cosmetics and what goes in the eye. If I were to look in my wife's cosmetic bag or something, I have no idea. That's the point of that lecture I want to create. Let's look at exactly yeah, what is all this yeah, stuff. But, but the uh, I take a real important thing is that cosmetics are known to have been used over 4,000 years ago in Egypt and not only to look pretty, but also to ward off the evil eye. What these cosmetics are doing today is potentially creating an evil eye and you have to ward it off. I like that. So before I let you go, David, let me just ask you a couple questions. What do you think was the biggest improvement from the original TFOS dues to TFOS dues to what were, what were your takeaways? If you wanted, if you wanted to share your brain with, with clinicians, what do you think they should recognize as the difference? What were the key updates to dues to? So the really important thing is that the TFOS dues um, prompted a huge amount of research, which it really increased over the next X years, and it continues to do so. With that, there were, there were really important areas that I, I know that I personally wanted to see in TFOS dues too, which we did. And one of them was the iatrogenic subcommittee, uh, because I had been asked to give a talk on iatrogenic problems in the eye in different places in the world, and it was a it opened my eyes to like, this is a huge area that I'm not really familiar with. And that was very important. I knew that adding in the section on sex, gender, and hormone, I, I'd worked on that area for, for many, many years, but it, people are unaware. And so it got its own special setting. There were several areas here, not just in terms of updating, also in terms, well, in epidemiology, there were things that we, we, we didn't know. In the pathophysiology, we've learned so much more. It's really hard to, to pull out one area or not. Just the diagnostic methodology was critically important because here, and it's been followed up again with Chris and his report, but there are indicators for how, how to just identify the appropriate patients, whether they have it or not, and, and how do you perhaps conduct that, that analysis, initial analysis. You know, so these different areas that have grown, and it's based on so much research that's been done in between and clinical experience. And so there are any, any number of takeaways. But if one of my favorites is the iatrogenic, only because, and, and I remember one of the, the people in a meeting we had in Barcelona for the iatrogenic subcommittee, I won't say his name, but he said, oh my goodness, are we actually going to tell people about this? Because, you know, refractive surgery, what it may be, you know, yeah, absolutely, we're going to tell people about this and we're going to let them know. It's open, it's transparent, so. Yeah. Well, Professor Badwan will be doing our iatrogenic section. I look forward to that. Chris, did you have, you know, let me share with you two, two things that I thought were significant about the update of DFOS2. First of all, the recognition of the neurosensory component. Neuropathic pain, neurotrophic keratitis, I think to, to us, that was me, that was a missing link that I'd been overlooking. And second, very, very important. As someone who spoke to, to doctors for years about infl inflammation in the tear film, and I'd always come ag against uh, your friend Mike Lemps, the number 86 probably means something to you, right? It's all 86% MGD. But recognizing it used to be a, a bifurcation. You're either evaporative or aqueous insufficient, and now it's a continuum. We recognize that there's an overlap between the two and that inflammation can be present 
in evaporative dry eye, elevated osmolarity, high levels of interferon gamma. So recognizing it's not an either or. A lot of these patients, are, yes, there's a lot of MGD, but there's also a lot of inflammation. Well, what did you take away from the updates, Chris? Uh, so many things. I mean, certainly those are big, big ones. I think the role of the corneal nerves the nerve, from the neuropathic to neurotrophic spectrum is incredible. And we're still learning a lot about that in the next TFOS news there will be probably a lot more uh, that we know. And thanks to people like Anat and Pedram and, and others who are doing a lot of good research in this. But I think from clini a clinician standpoint, and this is where the education comes in, educating people the role of sensation and pain and, and where it fits in and what is what. And if it's not always dry eye, if they have pain or if they have signs or if they don't have signs and what have you. There's a lot of confusion. This is why this field is so fascinating, but also so confounding for a lot of people and, and so difficult for a lot of clinicians who don't take the time to think about these things. If everything is called dry eye, but it's neuropathic or neurotrophic or some, anything in between, you know, when you treat it like it's dry eye, those patients are still going to suffer and you're going to have a lot of frustration uh, back and forth. So uh, that's, that was a big part. It was in the, added to the definition, which I thought was a huge update for TFOS2s too. I like the, the sensitivities around the global the differences that different cultures and different languages, the way they express symptoms. I think that was covered nicely in TFOS2s too. And there was a lot of work to make it less US centric or English centric as far as how people describe symptoms and how different cultures address those. Same with the sex and the hormonal differences amongst the gender and sex differences. I thought that was fascinating. I think the, the going from a three to two layer tear film was, was revolutionary uh, for the way we think about the ocular surface and the tears and the traditional teaching of the three layers. And now we're talking about a muco aqueous layer, mixed layer. I mean, that's a fundamental change as far as I'm concerned. The diagnostic algorithm, the tear breakup time, non-invasive tear breakup time as part of the uh, algorithm was incredible to me. I mean, there's so many things. This is just off the top of my head. I could keep going uh, if, I, if I gave it some more thought. Oh, the um, all dry eye is evaporative, you know, and, and, the, and that, yeah, I guess it's, it's in the writing that there was some talk of uh, this distinction between hyper evaporative dry eye and evaporative dry eye and, and muddying those waters and that the decision was, let's just keep it the, the aqueous and evaporate, evaporative dry eye for the sake of the world and the understanding that people are so comfortable with these terms as, as they are, that that was a step that we didn't take, that you didn't take, you know, to, to, to go into that evaporative route. And I thought that, you know, there's so many, so many little tidbits and pearls from, from this that I find incredible. Well, we will be doing a complete overview through each subcommittee, David, as you may know. And whether you know it or not, we're going to have you back for a couple more of these to enlighten us some more. Next, I believe we're talking to both Kelly Nichols and Jennifer Craig at the same time to talk about definition and classification should be a lot of interest. So we're going to run through each subcommittee and really look at what are the clinical takeaways. And David, let me just ask you one last thing. For, for doctors who are not aware of TFOS or how to join or how much it costs or what are the benefits, can you give us a quick how-to? I, I know, uh, well, go ahead. I'll let you talk about that. Sure. Simply go to tearfilm.org, T-E-A-R-F-I-L-M.org. TFOS membership is free. And you can write to the people there and say that you're interested in getting involved in various activities or initiatives of TFOS. And... We have things going on all over the world right now. And, and particularly if you go on to tearfilm.org, click on the video that you see because it's the trailer for the next TFOS workshop. And it's, it's a special trailer. Chris, David, thank you again so much for your, for your time. Listeners, we really appreciate you tuning in. And uh, we hope that you'll catch more of our episodes to get the clinician's takeaway, turning research into reality, looking at TFOS dues too. Thanks again. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Join us for our next episode soon. Find us online at www.ocularsurfaceacademy.com, all major podcast platforms, and YouTube. For over 18 years, iEco has been an industry leader of natural, effective, at-home dry eye management. From our line of tea tree eyelid cleansers and patented controlled moist heat compresses to our nighttime hydrating masks and daytime moisture chambers. We support you and your patients with scientifically proven products for mild, moderate, and severe dry eye. 
Join us today to experience the iEco difference at iEco.com. That's E-Y-E-E-C-O.com.